So here is just a simple math review uh, to cover the basics of variables and graphing. So to start off, when we deal with graphing, we often, we always deal with at least two variables. And in most cases here, we'll only deal with two variables. And those two variables are known as exogenous or endogenous variables. But a lot of people will know them more as independent or dependent variables. So if I think on a graph like this, uh, often people will see it as up here we're going to have the dependent variable, down here the independent variable. And what is an independent variable? Well, an independent variable or an exogenous variable is a variable that is taken as given. It's determined outside of the theory. We're not determining it. It's just there. It's just the amount of whatever good is available. The endogenous variable is, on the other hand, is explained within the theory or depends on <clears throat> what's going on out there. So I guess the biggest thing here to note is just that if you're used to seeing independent variable and you hear the word exogenous or autonomous, you could treat them as uh, equal. And if you're used to seeing dependent or endogenous, well, endogenous induced and dependent variable could all be treated the same. <clears throat> So here, when I give you a graph uh, or give you two variables and I ask you to graph it, uh, I get different responses. Okay, so I get different responses uh, from students over the years based on uh, graphing these two things. As I mentioned in the previous slide, some people will decide, well, I'm going to put cakes here because the amount of cakes depends on the amount of eggs. This is my dependent variable. I'll put it up here. And I'll put eggs down here. That's one way to graph it based on prior knowledge, prior uh, information that we've done it in a certain way in the past. The other way that some people would say would be to say that <clears throat> typically when you have two columns, the columns on the left is associated to uh, the x axis, which is your horizontal axis, and the column on the right is associated to your y axis, your horizontal axis. However, I'm going to go with the technique of saying that this is our dependent variable. It doesn't really matter, uh, but I'll just put eggs up here and I will put cakes uh, down here. Actually, that's the <coughs> opposite. So this situation actually is not uh, the situation with the dependent variable and independent variable. It's with this setup here that I have cakes on the x-axis and eggs on the y-axis. And in another way, you could also see it that <coughs> the amount of eggs required to purchase depends on the amount of cakes we want to make. Then afterwards, once we've established this, we could then graph it. So if I want to make one cake, I need two eggs. If I want to make two cakes, I need four eggs and so on and so forth. So I would have this uh, <coughs> upward axis. I didn't put zero, zero, but naturally if I have zero eggs, I won't make any case. So this is the situation that we have here. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, I've put eggs and cakes this way, but it could have been the opposite. I could have cakes and eggs. The reason why I say this is that in chapter three, we're going to be looking at the demand curve and the demand curve tells us the relationship between quantity demanded and the price of a good. If you think about it from a dependent and independent standpoint, well, the quantity depends on the price. <clears throat> it's not the price that depends on quantity, but by convention and economics, we set it up this way. We're going to set up a demand curve like this, essentially saying that we have this relationship between price and quantity. So in both of these instances, what we're representing is relationships okay, or correlations. We have this situation like this. We're not really talking about cause and effect relationships so much. We're just showing the relationship between two things. So in this situation here, even though quantum demand depends on price, I could represent it this way. And the reason why we represent it this way is just easier to visualize uh, when we do many manipulations. And that's why some textbooks, you'll see this as not the demand curve, but they will call it the inverse demand curve. Not all textbooks do this, but some do. 
once we've established this uh, graph, <coughs> we then have to understand how to calculate the slope. So the slope, for a lot of people, they go quickly and say, well, it's your rise over your run. So what is rise over run? Well, let's say I take two points here, and if I I've established that cakes is the x-axis, so my rise is going to be by how much I've risen uh, in eggs. So from six to eight, or let's say I'll go, my new point is eight minus the six. So I've gone from here to here. So this is my new point. That's why I subtract that. And then over my run, well, it's going from three to four. So I'm getting one. So I have two over one. My slope is of two and it makes sense. It's nice and steep. It's steeper than one. This is my rise over run. So two over one <coughs> is equal to two. Okay, so this is one way of doing it. But if you're in, you have another context and you're given y is equal to 3x plus 2. Well, we know in this case here that the coefficient in front of the independent variable will give me the slope. So in this case here, the slope would be 3. If I had y is equal to 2 minus 6x, the slope would be minus 6. So that's another way to determine the slope. So as I mentioned, rise over run <coughs> or the other technique will calculate your slope. Any straight line has a constant slope. So if I draw, whether it's upward sloping or downward sloping, and it's perfectly straight, as if you're drawing it with a ruler, it's going to have a constant slope. Whereas a curve that has more of a shape like this does not have a constant slope. Here we can see, if you think about it from the slope perspective of going skiing, if you were to start skiing down here, that's nice and mellow, and then woo, it starts getting steep. If you're a beginner, this kind of terrain, this kind of steepness is scary. Whereas here, it's nice and steep throughout, but it's not surprising you at any point in time. Okay? So these graphs reflect correlations or relationship, not necessarily cause and effect relationships. If we're talking about correlation versus causation, well, causation tells me that one thing causes another. <clears throat> Correlation just says that there's this mutual relationship between the two. Here we're talking about this mutual relationship. Because if we were talking about causation, this is just a nice little meme to show or a nice little cartoon to show that uh, it's not always causation. So let's say we say a new study found Colorado has a lowest obesity level of any state. That's the situation that we have. That's the result. But here, she treats it as if there's causation. You know what that means. No, what? Forget dieting, we're moving to Colorado, as if living in Colorado causes people to be in better shape. It's not necessarily the case. There's just a correlation that there is more people in shape in Colorado. So <clears throat> uh, we're talking more about relationships here and then cause and effect for the moment. So just different things to keep in mind. So how to graph calculating the slope and uh, this idea of that mutual relationship.